Well, two things before we dive into the text. First, Mike Walden's over here, and he takes care of me and makes me look good, taking care of the slides every Wednesday. Let's show our appreciation to him, all right? And second, I've been asked, do what? And Kathy's keeping him straight. All right. All right. He said it. Um. And then uh, the, the mission team going to Guatemala, there's eight of us, and each of us has been asked to, to get at least three people to pray for us. And so will you pray for me on the trip? All right. So here's what I'm asking you to pray for for me personally. Pray that I get to lead someone to Jesus, at least one, uh, on the trip. Uh, pray that uh, the team would be able to be there and return healthy and there would not be any any issues with sickness or and that we would be return safe. We'd go there and return and, and so for safety as well, but for personally that I'd be able to lead someone to Jesus. And also that as I train the pastors and church leaders, that they would grasp the principles I'm teaching. A lot of what I'll be teaching is what I taught you last spring when we went over hermeneutics. Do you, some of y'all remember that? And so how to interpret the Bible in its context, because I'll be talking to uh, what we would call life group leaders and, and pastors. And so um, I'm hoping that they will uh, receive that well. They did last year, and I believe they will this year. But pray those, th uh, those things for me. Also pray for my family. Um, you know, I do everything at home. And... and um, <laughs> And uh, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Uh, I, I do little to nothing because my wonderful wife takes great care of me and the family. Um, so that's not really going to be any challenge. Just me not sitting in the recliner each night and seeing me there will be their challenge this next week. So, all right. Well, the outline is on the back of your prayer sheet there, and it's pretty simple tonight. Kept it to three major points. Those that like three points can say amen to that part. And um, we're going to continue the story. Um, and so I want to start before diving into 1 Samuel with the question. The, the trend today is to go to two extremes. Some people say that we should not show any emotion in our worship of God. Um, and they're very stiff and then other people are so enthusiastic that they don't, I don't know that they know what they're doing or saying. Um, and so I'll let you look up the videos of, of uh, the uncontrollable dancing and shouting and things, okay? Um, but worship has gone multiple different directions. And I believe the Bible is very clear that when it comes to our relationship with God and worship of God, there is a way in which he wants to be worshiped. And there are ways in which he does not want to be worshiped. In Nehemiah chapter 8, and I'll have this on the screen for you, you don't have to turn there. Beginning in verse 5, we see an example of proper worship. It says, Ezra opened the book in the night, and all the people, for his standing above all the people, and we opened the book, all the people stood up. And so right there, if you're wondering why um, some churches and why on Sundays I have a stand, it really comes from this text. When they found, they found the word of the Lord in the temple, and now Ezra is going to read it, and all the people stood for the reading of the word. Okay, Verse 6, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so this right here is a proper expression of worship. This right here is a proper expression of worship. Going to your knees is a proper expression of worship. Having your face down on the ground is a proper expression of worship. And we see that they practice those things right there in Nehemiah as the word of the Lord was read. I do want to point out those things happened um, not in response to music, but in response to God's word. Uh, that's not a rebuke, it's just a statement that typically we see more expression 
when there's a beat, obviously, that helps, and music. And so the way we worship here is appropriate on a Sunday, by the way. If you're wondering what I think, absolutely it's appropriate. But I'm saying people responded to hearing the word, not even preached, but just read by falling on their face, by lifting their hands. So if you feel the need to raise your hands and, and you know, do this any time, at any time when I'm preaching or teaching, by all means. Okay. All right. So now we're in 1 Samuel, and we're going to see how they worship here in this text. And it's not a worship service, but it does show us that God cares about how we look to Him, how we worship Him, how we revere Him, or a lack thereof. So let me give you the background. All right? The background is the Philistines whooped the Israelites, took the ark of God to the land of the Philistines. While there, it went from city to city as God brought tumors on the men, very painful tumors on the men. And so each city would say, get the ark out of here. Hopefully the tumors will go away if we get rid of the ark of God. So it went from city to city, so to speak, among the Philistines. Then the Philistines say, enough, get the ark. Send the ark back to Israel. Okay? So tonight we pick up with the ark of God, which represents the presence of God. The ark of God is what was in the holy of holies within the tabernacle. And the two cherubim on top and the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that's where the, the, the high priest would one day a year be able to enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of God is the Ark of the Covenant, same thing. All right. So now that Ark got taken out of the Holy of Holies, was in the land of the enemies. Now they're saying, send it back. And now we pick up the story with it being sent back and how Israel responds to its return. All right? So we're going to pick up in verse 13. And before, before I read it, let me give you this too. So they, they decide to send the ark back, but here's what the Philistines say. The Philistines say, we're going to get two milch cows, and I found out that's, that's cows producing milk. All right? And those two cows are going to pull a cart that has the ark of God on it along with these golden tumors and golden mice as a reminder of God's judgment on the Philistines. So notice, God, the ark of God's going back, but God's also bringing some wealth with him. These things of gold are worth money, okay? Lots. And so now the Philistines are not just sending the ark back, they're sending money. They're sending financial benefit to Israel back, and Israel hadn't done a thing. Okay, it's God doing that. But they say, if we're going to take the calves and put them over here, and we're going to tell the two cows to head that way, and their natural motherly instinct is going to be to nurse their calves. But if they keep walking, and they go all the way to Beth Shemesh with this ark, then we know that this judgment has truly been from God. But if they turn around and go to their calves, we're going to believe that it was just coincidence that we're in all this pain from these tumors. Okay, So they're putting God to the test, which is not a smart thing to do. All right, So now the ark's going to arrive. Okay, And number one, the ark is returned to Israel. So when the ark returned, we see the Beth Shemites were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Look with me in verse 13 of chapter 6. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they raised their eyes and saw the ark, and they were glad to see it. Now, Matthew Henry wrote this. The devil visits idle men with his temptations. God visits industrious men with his favors. All right? If you see throughout Scripture, God comes to people that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. On the night of Jesus' birth, what were the shepherds doing? Exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Later in 1 Samuel, in chapter 16, Samuel comes to, um, he comes to Jesse and says, Hey, bring in your boys. I need to anoint one of them as the next king. And the Lord says, No, that's not, one. That's not the one. That's not the one. And he finally says, Do you have any other sons? He says, Yeah, my youngest. He's out what? Shepherding the sheep. David was doing what he was supposed to be doing when he was called in to be anointed 
as the next king of Israel. So here, the men of Beth Shemesh are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, the men of Beth Shemesh are, this is now in the land of Israel, okay? This is not a Philistine city. These, these are the Israelites here. Beth Shemesh is one of their cities, uh, and they are not idle. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But second, the Beth Shemites rejoiced in the return of the ark. It says in verse 13, second part, and they raised their eyes and saw the ark and were glad to see it. You better believe they were. Now, Beth Shemesh was a, was a city of priests as well. It was a Levitical city, and from the Levites come the priests among Israel. And so these are the very people that care most about the ark <laughs> because that, that's where the high priest from among them goes into the tabernacle. This is, this is very important to them. And here God returns his ark to them. So they are very glad to see the ark. Uh, unlike the, the, the last Philistine city that was like, no, don't even bring it here. Okay. Third, I want you to see the best Shemites performed acts of worship. Look with me in verse 14. The cart came into the field of Joshua, the best Shemite, and stood there where there was a large stone. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now, without any study, you would read that and stop and say, this is good. They, they, they sacrificed to the Lord. They used the wood of the cart to build an altar for the sacrifice. This is good, but it's not good because what they did right here was irreverent. He was irreverent. All right, so what did they do wrong? Well, verse 15, the Levites, which was the tribe of Israel from which the priests uh, come, took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was in it in which the articles of gold and put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices that day to the Lord. So here they are. Now not only are the ones that are initially there taking the wood from, from the cart and taking the cows, and, but they're sacrificing many animals, many. I mean, it's a, it's a large worship service of sacrificing animals, shedding blood in worship to the Lord. And in, in one sense, you would say that's a good thing. They were not responding like the Philistines, placing the ark of God before the, the idol Dagon. No, no, no. They're worshiping the one true God, but they're, you're going to see they're not doing it correctly. And here's why. Leviticus Chapter 1, verse 3, here's what it says. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male without defect. Now, the two cows that they offered, were they male? Nope. So God doesn't just care about us worshiping him however we want to. He cares about us worshiping him appropriately. And he gave them the proper way to worship Offer an animal, but it must be a male without defect. And they did not meet that. They just went and took those two milch cows and offered them to the Lord. And he did not care for that. God wants accuracy. He, he cares about how we approach him. Let's be honest. Throughout the world, there are people worshiping false gods and they're doing it sincerely. They're doing it passionately. They're doing it, in their view, reverently. I have a picture. This is a picture. Look at all those people bowing there. I think that's Mecca. I think that's the main location for the Muslims. They're all bowing. They're not laughing. They're not flippant about it. They're very sincere. But they're irreverent because they're worshiping the wrong God. And they're irreverent because they're not worshiping God the way the Bible says he ought to be worshiped. Okay? So that looks reverent, yet it's not. Are y'all with me? Amen. Then I could show you other pictures of people hooping and hollering and they don't know what they're doing. That's not reverent either. And so there are many ways to be irreverent. <laughs> And God has his way that he wants to be worshipped. Now, is he calling us to offer animal sacrifices? No, because Jesus has fulfilled all that. He's the ultimate sacrifice. We read about it in Hebrews 9 very clearly, 8 and 9, that he is the one sacrifice sufficient for all the sins of all time. 
And so we don't need to do that anymore. So the, the way they were to worship here in 1 Samuel is not identical to the way he wants us to worship him today, but the reverence is the same. He wanted to be worshipped reverently then, and he wants to be worshipped reverently today. And may we be faithful to do so. Brings us to number two, God judges Beth Shemesh. Verse 19, he struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. All right, so we already know they offered two female cows and they shouldn't have done that, right? Now here, it even gets more intense. When they got the ark back, they touched it, they opened it, they looked in it. They did not have permission to do that. They were not supposed to do that. Later on in the book of 2 Samuel, you'll find a man that touches the Lord and he dies there on the spot as they're moving the ark. Here, they looked in it. But let me take you to Numbers chapter 14, verse 15. It'll be on the screen for you. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary... When the camp is to set out, after the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them. So they will not touch the holy objects and die. So all the stuff from the tabernacle is taken down, and they have to cover the objects, and then specific people, the descendants of Kohath, are actually the ones that take the objects from one location to the other when Moses was leading the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. That's what I'm talking about here. Okay, specific people handle them and they're not to touch them. They're not to mess with the holy objects. If they actually touch them without being covered, they die. And now these men, hey, let me have a peek. Oh, look here. And now many of them have been struck down in Beth Shemesh. Now, who are the people of Beth Shemesh? Israelites. Be, be careful when you think, hey, God won't, won't do that to God's people. Yeah, he will. Yeah, he will. Here's the ark that the Israelites had lost in battle. Here's the ark that frustrated the Philistines and brought the tumors upon the men. Here was the ark that had triumphed over the enemy. Here's the ark that had come back into the land of Israel without any help from anybody else. Our God is a powerful God. He is worthy to be worshipped and worshipped reverently. So let's ponder ways we could be irreverent today. Think about ways you can be irreverent. It's not just in, in a worship service, but... It, is a reverence not shown in praising God through song? Love you, Lord. And then living in deliberate, continual sin? I love you, Lord. I refuse to repent. I love you, Lord. I'm not going to go by your word. That's a practical way to apply what they're, they're doing. Hey, man, we're sure glad the ark of God is back. Hey, look, do you see this right here? You know? Let me just open up the, the ark. They're irreverent even though they're happy. Is it irreverence not shown by claiming to love God but neglecting to read His Word? God, I love you. But no, I really don't want you to speak to me. I'd like you to just leave me alone. I'm not going to read. Is irreverence not shown today by claiming to believe His Word which teaches us to minister to the hurting and pray for the sick and evangelize the lost, but then we don't participate in these acts of kindness to others. Verse 19, second part, it gets worse. He struck down of all the people 50,070 men. Seems severe in one sense, doesn't it? All they did was worship you they offered female instead of male all they did was worship you they oh, so what they opened the ark what's the big deal 50,070 and how do they know it's that number they counted them it's not 50,080 y'all with me 
I mean, good night. They counted every single person that died, I guess, within a day after they opened the ark. God, God doesn't mess around. What did they do? Did they worship him? Yes. So he cares about our heart. He cares about our respect for him and his word. He cares about being worshiped reverently. Rituals do not suffice. Verse 19, third part. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. They mourned their losses. But I'm not necessarily reading that they are mourning because of sin. They're mourning because of loss. Notice what it says. The people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. It didn't say they mourned because of the wickedness of the people and God brought judgment on their wickedness. It's almost like, oh man, my, my husband, my father, my son, all these, all these family members are dead. God, this is terrible. Rather than, sorry Lord for the thing we've made it, which is worship our way. So God is righteous in His judgment. He does not tolerate alternative ways of worship. He does not tolerate us altering the ordinances and and the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine at the Lord's Supper. It's not Pepsi and potato chips. The elements matter. God's a detailed God. And the elements matter. They mattered in the tabernacle and temple. They mattered in the holy place and the holy of holies. What's in the ark matters. and, and now what we do with the ordinances, they matter. The way we worship matters. Now, you could be thinking the way God judged them, that's an Old Testament thing. But God in the New Testament's love. God is love throughout Scripture. And the way He responded in the Old Testament is the way He responds in the New. Take Ananias and Sapphira. Hey, I mean, they gave. But he demanded more than giving. He demanded faithful giving. Take 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, the text where on the Lord's Supper, and he, and he talks to the church of Corinth. He says, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. What Paul was telling the church of Corinth is those that are asleep, those are the ones that have died. And they died. Why? They partook of the Lord's Supper in a flippant, casual manner. The same thing that happens with the ark in the Old Testament happened to the people in Corinth in the New Testament after Jesus died and was buried and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father. So God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's not that God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament and a God of love in the New Testament. He is the same God throughout all of human history. He's the same God for eternity. In 1 Samuel 6, 50,000 plus died. And this led those that survived in verse 20 to say, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up from us? So here, this verse can be taken positively and negatively. They are noticing, notice what they say first, God did this. All 50,070 men are dead because God judged them. So they're not giving credit to anybody else but the Lord. That's that's a positive thing. He wants credit for it. But they say, who is able to stand before the Lord? And what they're saying is, no one is holy enough to escape this type of judgment. And that is not true. Moses lived it. Samuel in their day was living it. And so it was possible to stand before a holy God pleasing to him. The ones that looked in the ark and the ones that offered the female cows instead of male cows, they simply were defying the word of God. And Samuel had not. And so it was, they say, who was able to stand before the Lord? Samuel could. Amen? Amen. 
Now number three, Beth Shemesh sent the ark away. Verse 21. So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath-Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. That sounds familiar from previous texts, doesn't it? Come get this ark. (laughs) The Philistines said it to each other. And now we've got the men of Beth Shemesh, those that are still alive, telling the men of Kiriath-Jerim, please come get this ark. Now, the city of Kiriath-Jerim was about, I think, 10 miles northeast. And it was not a Levite priestly city. It was a city of the common Israelites, the other tribes of the Israelites. And they're asking, the Beth Shemesh is asking Kiriath-Jerim to come get the ark and take it. And it says... Well, I'll get to it in just a moment. They come and get it, though, and I'll read it in just a moment. So they get the ark, and they take it to kiriath Jerem. Where did the ark, where was the ark before it went into the battlefield and the Philistines took it? Where's the ark in the beginning of the book? Starts with an S. Shiloh. Okay, it was in Shiloh. That's where Eli was the, high, the priest, and that's where Samuel was raised and taught uh, to be a priest. And then it was taken to the battlefield. It never returns to Shiloh. It's going to go to a, a man's house. We're about to read about it. It's going to go to his house in kiriath Jerem. It's going to stay there for a long time. And when Saul's king, it leaves for a short period of time. I think that's in 1 Samuel 14. Let me check my notes here. 1 Samuel 14. Yes. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David's going to have it relocated. And so it stays in this man's house about 20 years and never returns again to Shiloh. So now let's take a look at it being moved, and uh, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here. 1 Samuel Chapter 7, verse 1, And the men of kiriath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So here are the people of kiriath Jerem. They're happy to receive the ark of God. The ark of God is brought into the house of this man on a hill. By the way, we don't... I learned this when I started traveling on some mission trips. When you go to other places, every place is always trying to build their their church on the highest hill in town. Uh, When I've gone to Guatemala, it's been that way in general sense, but in Ecuador, exceptionally, except that's not the right word, um, every time we would go to a town, find the highest hill, and there was the Catholic building. Then when I went to Nepal, the Hindu building temple was typically on the highest hill around. Well, here, in a positive way, they are taking the ark of God and placing it in a house on a hill. Um, And you do see in Scripture where worship happened in high places, did it not? Jesus would go off to the mountain to pray. uh, Moses was on Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments came. Uh, Jesus transfigures before before James, Peter, and John on the mountain. I mean, a lot of things happen on high places, so that's not a bad thing. And I think many churches today are trying to imitate that and try to bring that back to happening for them. And here, the house of Abinadab is on the hill. So the ark of God is going to the highest place in the area. And his son is appointed to watch the ark. So the, the ark is not placed in the Holy of Holies behind a curtain, It's not placed near the furniture of the holy place. It's now in a house and will be there for some time. Quite a bit of time. Now verse 2 of 1 Samuel 7. From the day that the ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim, the time was long. For it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Let me ask you, 
Are you like the Philistines when God disciplines you or judges you? You don't run to Him and make it right. You want to distance yourself from Him. I think in our community, many people are in that category. They tried the Lord and... Maybe they weren't reverent enough or maybe they weren't holy enough. They weren't obedient to his word and they're going through major strife in their life. And instead of running to the Lord in repentance, they've dropped out. They don't read the word. They don't attend church. They're distraught. They're down. That's the Philistines. Are you there? Are you like those in Beth Shemesh? You're happy to have the presence of God where you're at. That is, as long as you get to worship Him your way. We see a lot of that in our land too. I love Jesus. I just, I don't believe in that giving part though. It's my money. I love Jesus, but I'm going to continue to cohabitate with someone I'm not married to. I love Jesus, but He accepts me. And what some Christians say is sin is not sin. Even though it's in the Bible as a sin, it's not a sin. We have a lot of Beth Shemesh going around too. Happy the ark of God's there, but how they worshipped was how they wanted to worship rather than what He said and how to worship Him. Could it be that you are one of those? Is that, is that you? Are you a Philistine or are you Beth Shemesh? You want God to bless your life. You just don't want to have to change anything about your life. And meet Him His way. Or are you like the people of kiriath Jerem that want God and His presence, but you want all of Him? You want His Word. And when you're in sin, you want to be convicted. You want to be disciplined. And when you're walking in holiness, you want to be encouraged. You want God leading you. You want Him not to just help you. You want Him to be the Lord of your life. That's the people of kiriath Jerem. Do you see the differences in the three groups? Which one are you in? And may we all be in the, the kiriath Jerem camp. We realize our need for God. We're overwhelmed by His presence and His protection, His provision, His goodness, His grace. And we realize we have it better than we deserve. Amen. That He's already done it all by paying for our sin and we did not deserve that that we deserve a life alienated from Him and an eternity in hell. But by His grace, He forgives, He saves, He guides, He leads, He provides, He cares for us as a shepherd to sheep. There's nothing better than walking in obedience to the Lord. To know Him and to revere Him. May that be the people we are. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that you would help us to be all in with you. That whatever your word says, we follow. Help us to be Bible anchored. You and your word are, are our authority. We are here to submit, to follow, to live surrendered lives to your will and your ways because you are worthy, God. You are holy. You created us. You sustain us. You've saved us. Oh, God, use us. Be pleased with us. Be pleased with our worship and our reverence of you. Help us to be holy. You tell us to be holy as you are holy. Oh, God, help us. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Fill us with faith. And I pray that you would help us to help others that might be in the Philistine camp or the Beth Shemesh camp. 
Oh God, help us to help them to see how great you are and that you are worthy to not only be praised for you dying for us, but to be praised for your leading of us today. That your way is always best. So help us not to trust in our trust in ourselves, but to trust in you and your word. Acknowledge you in all our ways, that you may direct our paths. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for what you've taught us through the first six chapters of 1 Samuel. We look forward to the rest of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.